Welcome to the Deeper Life Bible Study, coming to you from Identity Church in Deltona, Florida. Now let us hear the expounding of the Word of God, a now word for this moment. So grab your Bible, sit back as we delve into the Word of God, and hear the Logos and Rhema Word. Tonight's teaching is our third uh, teaching on the book of Job. I'm going to finish it tonight. Uh, Lord will and creek don't rise. You know how that works. And if the creek is rising, we're going to float across it. But um, I would title tonight's message, uh, you know, um, the release uh, of Job's captivity or affliction. Let's do that. A re release of Job's affliction. Anybody understand that? Anybody been afflicted? Anybody been afflicted? I've been afflicted. Um, my soul's been vexed. My mind has been tormented, and you think you're going to die. But uh, I just, I'm just i going to really kind of hit some things. Um, I, I actually personally have enjoyed taking some time and studying the book of Job. Uh, but we rightly suppose that Job was a very religious man and that he was uh, acquainted with God and religion as it was understood in practice in those days. Now listen, you got to understand, Job is the oldest book in the Bible. He no doubt knew the many traditions and revelations of God up to that time, being the grand, listen, you got to understand something, he was the grandson of Jacob. He was born about 352 years after Noah died, and about 200 years before Shem died. This would allow for the dates that Shem was 52 years after the flood. Okay, so you got you put this in historical record. 52 years after the flood, Genesis 11, 10, 11. Or he was a contemporary of Abraham. 150 years contemporary of Abraham. Abraham was 25 years to Isaac. Isaac was 60 years to Jacob. And Jacob was about 85 when Issachar was born. Issachar was about 30 years old when Job was born. I mean, so you, you look at his patriarchal, uh, historical pull that he had. Look, look at his, look at his, his ancestry. Uh, Job was 70 when he was afflicted. He wasn't a young man. He was 70 years old when all this happened to him. According to some scholars, that would make it only 772 years after the flood. After the flood. From this information above, we can understand how Job could know about the religious beliefs and practices of Shem, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Their spiritual experiences and the doctrines that they adhered to. We find many of the great doctrines of the Bible in the book of Job. Doctrine of God in the book of, of Job. Listen, to this. the doctrine of God in the book of Job. Characters, the characters in the book of Job all believed in one supreme being called Elohim. <clears throat> God's referring to the divine trinity of separate persons in the Godhead. This is everybody in the book of Job. Elohim, the word Elohim occurs 16 times in the book. El, or the strong one, or the mighty one, 54 times. Eloah, which is E-L-O-A-H, the living God, in contrast to idols and objects of works, was 41 times mentioned in the book of Job. And Jehovah, or Lord, is mentioned 31 times. So there's a lot of doctrine of God and his personalities in the Godhead all through the book of Job. Now, let's talk about those three friends that we talked about last week. Anybody got any people like that? They're in the room. <laughs> wow, I'm glad he was looking that way, not this way. See, the three friends of Job who couldn't understand what was going on is Eli, Eli Foz, Eliphaz, the Timonite. He gave his perspective from human experience. We all will have friends that when something goes on and they're trying to figure out what God's doing, they will relate to their own human experience. Bildad, the Shunite, he related from human tradition. 
It's always been that way. So God's not going to change, and this is the way it's going to be. And the Zophar, the Mennonite, uh, uh, Methanatite, whatever, he went from human merit. He put more, more merit in the human side. Uh, anybody got friends like that? Yeah, right over there. Everybody's pointing to Rodney tonight. Okay. But in chapter 3, and we, I'm, I'm just kind of doing a debrief to get started tonight. Chapter 3, Job was so discouraged and so distraught that he cursed 17 curses on the day he was born. He, he spoke 17 curses on his birthday. He talked about his mama. He talked about, uh, you know, uh, his birth. I wish the day wasn't there. I mean, he was, uh, he, was, um, he was having a bad day. After this opening, Job opened his mouth, and this is Job 3, 1 through 3, opened his mouth and cursed his day. And Job spake and said, Let the day perish when I was born, and the night in which it was said there is a man-child conceived. He was not a happy camper. Um, but the one scripture I want to I want to pull back from last week is Romans chapter 8, 1 and 2. And it says, There is therefore no condemnation in them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So there is no condemnation. So all of his friends, you got to give them a break, didn't know Jesus. How many people that are your friends, you could make that same statement? They're my friends, but <clears throat> I don't know if they know Jesus. <laughs> Why? Because everything they do is human reasoning. Everything they do is human merit, human tradition, earthbound stuff. Okay. Then we talked about 17 statements of condemnation that his friends gave him. 72 condemnation statements from his three friends, that accusations that Job wasn't right. Anybody been accused that much? And then we talked about 44 statements of condemnation from Job about his friends. Say so they were having a bad day. But do you understand what happens when, when God has to allowed a, a test to come to your life that when we get under pressure, what is in us leaks out of us? His three friends, they leaked human tradition. They leaked, leaked human merit. They leaked human reasoning, their experiences. They leaked it. Like that's all they had in them. And so then Job, when he defended himself, he leaked what he had. Um, I'm going to go to, this was an interesting read here, because we went, all of these 72 condemnations from his friends and 44 from Job, it's pretty well taken up about 31, 32 chapters. All right, go home, read them. They're all pretty disgusting. Uh, <laughs> So, but I, I want to give you 21 false concepts of God. 21 false concepts of God that you'll see. 21 false concepts of God. This is, he breaks me with tempest, chapter 9, verse 17. He multiplies my wounds without cause. Will not permit me to take my breath. <laughs> These are accusations about God. Fills me with bitterness. Five, destroys the perfect with the wicked. This is what his friends came out of, him, Job and his friends. God destroys the perfect with the wicked. Laughs at the trial and calamity of the innocent. That's a... All right. Gives the earth into the hands of the wicked. Eight, confuses the judges. Nine, there is no mediator between God and man. See, the accusation, there's no mediator between me and God. Why? Well, Jesus wasn't there yet. you got to understand where they're at. I, I mean, that's a false accusation about God, except I can see it. I can see it. He lays his rod upon me. I think I've been beaten if I was him. Terrifies me with fear. I would think fear was kicking my butt. 
12, condemns and contends with me and does not show me the cause. He doesn't know why. 13, he oppresses me. 14, despises the work of his hands. That's a pretty deep accusation. I believe I was molded and shaped it in God's image. Well, he despises it. Look what he's doing to it. 15, shines upon the counsel of the wicked. 16, destroys me. 17, he pours me out like milk. 18, curdled me like cheese. <laughs> 19, hurts me like a fierce lion. 20, renews witnesses against me. That's interesting. Renews witnesses against me. Why? Because we talked about Job's friends, but there was a fourth guy that shows up in about chapter 32. We're going to talk about him. And, and, and that guy, I want to punch in the head. Okay, the three friends, the three friends are the three friends. But this guy is a young whippersnapper who's accusing everybody that they can't hear God and thinks he has God. I, I'd like to punch him in the head. And I've seen those guys around me. I hear God better than who, you know, you think you're the only one who can hear God? And they have all this wisdom, except they're just as dead wrong. But we're going to punch him in the head later. Um, which one was it? No. Uh, chapter nine, verse 33. Um, nine, 10 and part of 11, nine, 10 and part of 11 torments me until I cannot even take a little comfort. That's 21. Is it not strange that in one discourse, Job reveals almost as many false concepts about God as true ones. Concerning the above, it was Satan and not God who had brought all these miseries upon him. There's two world powers, God and Satan, the two greatest world powers, and if we're not careful, we will get them mixed up. I think that's that's what that is about right there. Um, I want to talk about ten false accusations of God. And this is in chapter thirteen. Uh, false accusations of God, starting in thirteen, verse twenty-four. You hide your face from me. Number two, you count me as an enemy. You break me like a leaf driven to and fro, verse 25. You pursue me as dry stubble. You write bitter things against me. This is, <laughs> he's saying, God, this is what you do. Six, you make to possess the iniquities of your youth. You make me to possess the iniquities of youth, verse 26. You put my feet in stocks. Eight, you look narrowly unto all my path. Nine, you set a print upon the heels of my feet. I don't even know what that means. Thus, you cause me to be consumed like a rotten thing or a moth-eaten garment. You're having a bad day with your relationship with God at this point. I would say he was probably very close to backsliddenness. Am I wrong? I mean, when you get to there, you're pretty well messed up. Delusional? Hopeless? Okay. Uh, I think backslidden is a pretty hopeless place to be. Sure. He's getting... But as soon as he knows it's God, he gives God good credit. But so, which means he's under a deceptiveness. Right. So, well, so what I'm saying is, is that when you're under this kind of pressure, be careful not to allow the enemy to deceive you and put God's name where his name should be. Okay. In other words, if, if, if you don't know what, he, in, what the enemy, the, who the enemy is you're fighting, you're going to fight the wrong one. Okay, Job chapter 32, 1 through 5. 
Here's here's where this L E L I H M dude comes from. That young hmm? Elihood. Well, Elihood is, and I put a parenthesis, a young punk. He's a punk. So verse 32, uh, chapter 32, 1 through 5. So these three men ceased to answer Job. He's talking about his three friends. Because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barachah, the Bizet of the kindred of Ram. Against Job was his wrath kindled because he justified himself rather than God. Also against his three friends was his wrath kindled because they had found no answer. They didn't have an answer, so they, he, he was mad at them, and yet had condemned Job. Now Elihu had waited till Job had spoken because they were older than him. When Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, then his wrath was kindled. (laughs) So I'm just going to break it down for you and give you ten false accusations by Elihu against Job. All right? Chapter 36, verse 21. Job drinks up scorning, blasphemy like water. 34, 7. He goes in company with workers of iniquity and walks with wicked men. 34, 8. He says, it profits nothing that I should delight in God. 34, 9. Job has spoken without knowledge and his words are without wisdom. 34, 35. He adds rebellion to his sin. <laughs> do, do you realize God said he's the most righteous of them all. He got into a a rolling dice with the devil and go, hey, have you tried my servant Job? He's the best I got. Let's try him. And this is the kind of accusation that goes on. Claps his hands among us and multiplies his words against God. Verse 37. Claims that his righteousness is more than God's. 35.2. He says, what profit shall I have if I be cleansed from my sins? 35.3. 35.3. He multiplies words without knowledge. Verse 16 of 35. You have chosen the way of iniquity rather than affliction. Verse 21. So not only did he have three friends that, that he had to debate with, he had a young whippersnapper that decided to come tell everybody what he thought. And, and you know what? It's interesting that young people that have never birthed anything in the spirit have an opinion on what we're all all the old people are doing wrong no one wants to look at me look at me evan isn't that true though everybody has an opinion but they haven't they haven't walked this walk they haven't they haven't sweat blood not to sin they haven't laid on their face and and and, and had to make sure that god was in the middle of their decisions for other people's survival? Uh, it just, maybe I'm wrong. I want to read Job 40, 1 through 8. Moreover, the Lord answered Job. Say, he answered Job. H- how many have ever, um, I- I'll tell you the scripture, Psalms 107, 24. Uh, Psalm, I believe it's Psalms 107. I was at my wit's end. And I threw a Bible down on the floor, and I threw a phone book down on the floor. And I said, if you don't talk me, to me through your book, I'm getting the phone book, and I'm calling an attorney, and I'm done. And he said, okay, if you're at your wit's end, so am I. And he gave me, go to Psalms 107. He says, when they were, came to their wit's end, their wit's end, doesn't that make sense? If you ever come to your wit's end, you don't have the answer anymore? When they've come to their wit's end, they cried out in their distress, and God answered them. (laughs) So I can say Job came to his wit's end here and said, Shall he that condemneth contend with the Almighty instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer it. When Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile, what shall I answer thee? 
I will lay my hand upon my mouth. In other words, shut up. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. Then answer the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind. Let me tell you something. You're, when you really got to hear God, he may have to talk to you out of his whirlwind. Not a tornado, a whirlwind. Gird up your loins, is what he said. Gird up your loins now like a man. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. Wilt thou also disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me that thou mightest be righteous? Let me tell you. Anybody been in so much misery that you cried out for God to speak, and then when he spoke, you wish he hadn't? Did you hear what he said to Job? Gird yourself up like a man. You know, God kind of got a little tick. Yeah, buckle up, buttercup. You know, I mean, he, 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 he tuned Job up. Where were you when I created this? Where were you when I did this? Where were you? He, he's like, hey, dude, you know. <laughs> Where were you, big boy? You, 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 you dare to challenge me, God, when you weren't even there when I did these things? You, you questioned and challenged my integrity. You questioned and challenged my fatherhood. You questioned and challenged my reasoning. S sounds good from the pulpit, but I've done it. Am I the only one that's done it? Yeah. That's a bad day. All right. I want to go to chapter 42, 1 through 7. When Job answered the Lord and said, Now that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withheld from thee. To see realize where he finally got, I'm dealing with God, and there's not even a thought that I can hide. When you can't hide your thought, you might want to keep your thoughts to yourself. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee that I will speak. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see thee. I'm going to catch a benefit. I want you to catch a benefit from some of the brokenness that happens when you've been a, when God has allowed affliction to come. You get out of yourself. You get out of your human reasoning, and you quit going by what you hear, and then you can start seeing. Luke chapter four, verse eighteen. Jesus says. Today the anointing is upon me to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captive, and the prisoner and the captive free, and to do what? To recover the sight of the blind. I don't believe that's people that are blind in the natural. I believe that's Christians who can't see him or his goodness. When, 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 he, when he says, I am done hearing about you, I want to see you, that's when you can go and you can start seeing the goodness of God. Is this making sense? So, so, so if God has allowed affliction, if God has allowed a hard time, it is to get you out of your humanist, human merit, human experience, human history, and get you into the eternal realm where you do what you see the Father do. Jesus did not on earth say, I do what I hear the Father do. Jesus said, I do what I see the Father doing. Are you catching this? 
So, so, so my question is, has your last se- season of affliction made you better or bitter? Made you deaf or blind? Faith comes from hearing. But I'm telling you, seeing gets past what you've heard and gets you into the goodness of God. That was good. I have heard of thee by the hearing of my ear, but now mine eyes seeth thee. Therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Do you understand what he's doing here? Because he saw, he saw God what happened. He repented. It's the goodness of God that brings a man to repentance. If you haven't seen his goodness, you'll think all the stuff that you accused him of doing that was the devil, you'll you'll never be free. But when you can see his goodness, you can get free of what you thought was wrong. Am I you catching this? And? I've only heard about you. Some people have only heard about God. They have never seen God. You know, I, I have people talk about my encounter I had with Jesus. You know, I got saved at about five years old. Again at seven, again at nine, again at 13. I, I kept going until I got it right. But until Jesus walked through the wall and introduced himself and I saw him, in the person of Jesus Christ, transformation didn't happen. Because I'd only heard about him. I just saw him. Some of you met sweet baby Jesus lying in a manger reading Luke chapter 2. I met the line of Judah. He threatened my life because he loved me. Why? When you see him in that kind of a brilliance and glory, your life changes. Your perception of him changes. This is why I believe the enemy works against the prophetic church. Because the prophetic church has an anointing and and creates an atmosphere to see. In the prophetic, to see God. Because if if, if, if you can't get past your own human understanding, and I'm not saying hearing's not bad. Hearing's good. Hearing, you know, hearing God is, is absolutely great and wonderful. But I'm telling you, seeing gets you past your human reasoning. Spiritually seeing. Your spiritual eyes. I believe you could include dreams, visions, your spirit man. I believe you'll you'll, you'll see that whole uh, realm there. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Timonite, my wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for you have not spoken of me the things that is right, as my servant Job has. So all of a sudden, he sees God, now catch this, he sees God, he went from hearing and, and knowing about to actually seeing his goodness You've got to catch this. And God decides to turn and defend him against his own friends. You want God to defend you? Find his goodness in the middle of your trial. Find your, his goodness in the middle of your, dis, 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 your, your dysfunction. I heard a good one. Y'all want to hear a good one from Kevin Mancuso today? I'm going to steal it. I, I'm going to give him credit one time. I was talking to Kevin, and he's, uh, he's up in Philadelphia or Pennsylvania, uh, working his trade, and, and it's it's a it's a union shop, and he's having to work in Maryland. And he goes, "Dude, we are in comparison. They hustle up north. You know, we're we're a bunch of lazy Floridians." And he goes, "Man, they're they're pushing me and hustling." And and my boss is like, "You know, you've been gone for twenty minutes." He said, "Like, you know, I haven't had a break in like seventeen hours. You know, they're working these crazy hours." He said, I needed to go to the pot, you know? 
And he goes, well, hurry up. And, and, and he goes, <laughs> he goes, he made a statement. He, he said, man, you, there's, you guys function like chaos. He goes, yeah, we do. But in chaos, there's always cash. He said, you're getting overtime and you shouldn't. So, so, so in the midst of chaos, you should find some cash. That doesn't excite you. That excites me. <laughs> Listen, when I can figure out that I can get more cash because there's chaos, why? Because I have the Prince of Peace that walks with me and I can maintain and I can get some favor because I'm not in your chaos, but around chaos, there's cash. Why? There's promotion. For somebody that can see the goodness of God and bring reality from that realm, past that realm. Listen, when, when God, God himself saw chaos, he spoke to it and started creating a new world. You know, that, that's kind of like cash. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. But when I, I, I need you to catch this principle here. Until Job caught the goodness of God in his vision, he had defended himself. Remember, remember what I said? He had 72 accusations from his friends, and he had 44 trying to defend himself. He had another 10 from his fourth young punk, and, and, and all of a sudden, he catches from hearing to seeing, and then within, within two verses, God turns and tells his three friends, I got something against you. Were you there? Yeah. Okay, but, but he, faith comes by hearing. So he's hearing God, and God is telling him, where were you, buddy? Who do you really think you are? And, and so, but so I believe it gave him enough faith to repent. And when he repent, he saw him and saw that he was good. So all the accusations got turned away. But I'm telling you, until you see the goodness of God, because he's a good God, say he's a good God, get over yourself, whatever it takes, get your eyes on his goodness, and then he will defend you. Why do we keep defending ourselves? It's because we haven't found him to be good yet. Absolutely. Oh, but, you know, we, we'll, we'll, we'll have a pom-pom party about the area we know, but we won't have one about the area that we're mad about. That, that burn husband you gave me or that wife you gave me or that, and, and, and you've got all this accusation and you got 72 accusations from your wife and you got 44 from your husband. That's a bad day. And God's not defending neither one of you. Absolutely. They always have more words than men. But it doesn't make them right. All right but but have, you caught, have you caught what I'm saying? We've got to get to seeing the goodness of God. Okay? Now, verse 9. Let me get to my thing. Verse 9. So El Eliphaz, the Temanite, and Beldad, the Shulite, and Zophar, the Menonite, went and did according to the Lord, commanded them. Now, verse 8 was he told them to go bring a sacrifice to repent. Okay? So God defends Job, tells his friends, your, your knuckleheads, and gave them instructions to go to the bull, get bulls, and... And, and repent. So they did what the Lord commanded them, and the Lord also accepted Job. I believe there's people that are living on the earth today is because I repented on their behalf. So as Job, so Job got involved with hearing God, 
defend him, seeing God's goodness, repenting, then God defending him to his friends and giving them instructions to bring a bright sacrifice because you're wrong, not like my servant Job. Job got in the middle of their repentance also. <laughs> Come on, me and Rodney get in a big old argument. He's right, I'm right, he's wrong, I'm wrong. It, it, okay, we, we're, we're interrelational. And we get into a big fight, and, and, and we, we duke it out. We come to our senses. Rodney goes, Charlie, I, I'm sorry. You said that, it triggered me, and then when I triggered, I said that, and then you said this, and then, okay, but if it was genuine repentance, don't you think because of our relationship, and I'm like, yeah, you were a jerk, but I shouldn't have responded that way. If I was a better friend, I wouldn't have let that make me respond. I mean, is this how friendships work? So he started the repentance. I had to engage with the repentance because of our relationship, our covenant. I wish husband and wives would learn that, and there just wouldn't be the stupid husband. The wife go, you know, I shouldn't book the bear like that. It's not always the husband that's wrong, even though he's wrong. Sometimes it's your snippy attitude. Thank you, Jesus. I got something out of my elder there. <laughs> but, yeah, be careful. <laughs> yes, dear. <laughs> but, but, I mean, are, are you hearing me? Look, look at this relationship. We, we, got, we got 40 chapters of bad, bad blood. God gets in the middle of it. He, he hears, then he sees. He defends the one who sees. You know why? Because when you've seen that kind of goodness, you'll automatically repent, even if it wasn't 100% your fault, or they started it, or they were wrong. You, you just say, hey, I, I, I need to repent for my involvement too. Okay. Yeah, but if you haven't seen the goodness of God, you won't find it. You walk around with resentment. I said I was sorry, but I still think he's wrong. Oh, shut up. Right? Look at that, that, that last part of verse 9. And the Lord also accepted Job. He came into collective agreement with his friend's repentance. Now, look at the benefit in verse 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. So, the affliction comes, the bad opinion of God comes, the bad opinions of my friends, and me defending, and all this stuff happens. Then I go from hearing about God being good to actually seeing his goodness. And then God defends Job, who he said was the most righteous man on the earth. Who he said, let's test, let's test him and see. And the devil's, oh, he'll curse you to your face. He'll but he didn't. But look at his heart. When his friends were put in cornered by, listen, his friends got cornered by God. When your friend gets cornered by God and you have not seen him, you'll go, yep, they deserve it. But when you've seen him, you go with them to help them repent. And then you get released of the captivity that you were in. All right, you want to see the picture? Was Jesus sinless? Did he know the Father? So to release us from our sin, he became sin. <laughs> Same principle. Same principle. And Jesus said, I don't do anything unless I see the Father. He saw the goodness of his Father, and he became sin so we could be released to sin. 
he became sin to a man who knew no sin. Why? Because so, he partnered with us in our depravity. He partners with us in our, in our inability to know God. And, and, and he became one of us. But then Father went, you're, you're not one of them. I release everyone. I release everyone. I release everyone from their captivity. Is it good? Hmm? You, you've never seen that in there? Me neither. <laughs> but, but I had a business call today that I was prepared for. And I was loaded for bear, and it didn't happen the way I thought. My bosses have actually asked me to be nicer, even though I'm not wrong. And this person that has literally, in my opinion, become my enemy, I said to him, I said, if we don't fix this between us, they're going to make a choice. We got to fix this. I said, I'll be back in town next week, and I'll come down and take you to lunch. He said, I am going nowhere, man. He said, I don't know if you notice all the weight I've lost. And I'm like, yeah, I noticed. He said, he's been battling throat cancer. And he's got another, he's had nine surgeries. And, and all of a sudden, I'm like, I can't stab him anymore, can I? So my boss called after the call. And we were having our, our staff meeting after that call. And I said to my boss, I said, yeah, Kim that works for me told me that I had the skill set to be a pastor if I wanted to. <laughs> and then one of my other employees says, yeah, but I don't think he wants to. <laughs> but when I see the captivity, and he's a Christian, I just have a hard time calling him my brother. I'm going to have to ask God for the compassion to be good to him, do the best I can to fix this relationship. Or my bosses are going to fix it because it's, we're, we're like two punks. We're, we're like these two punks right now. And, 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 and my boss even said that I was a very wise man because I was very quiet today. I didn't say much. And I realized that it really wasn't a, accusation against me but they are asking me for my help they know that i possess the ability to have wisdom and gracefulness Sure. I don't have a problem with that statement. I'm, I'm not there. But I, I'm, I'm not there until I see it. I didn't see it till today. I didn't know what we've been dealing with since August. I've just been dealing with somebody who's been going after my stuff. And I've been very quiet and very patient because you don't, you don't rattle the bars until you're ready to rattle the bars. And today, evidently, my bosses were ready to rattle the bars because it was like, 12.30, we're on the, you know. So, when you say that, this transitions to my mind and mind, so if you have that situation, if I go out and say, okay, there's got to be something wrong in our family situation. If I put you in the big book, should I be searching you for those reasons? Sure, I actually, I actually had the reason. I already had the reason. And I had, I had tried to deal with it in the, in the last two years. And, and it just keeps eroding. And, and I, I got to be honest with you, I've, I, was drawled my, I had already drawn my line in the sand. And I, I, I prepared. I, have, I, I, didn't, I had it all written down with facts and numbers and fix. I mean, I don't, I don't play when it comes to that. At the same time, when your bosses, when you recognize and realize they're not really shooting at you, but they're, because you're part of the situation, I got to get a spanking right with him. And we all, we both got a spanking. And my, my statement to, uh, on that call today was, listen, what our two bosses is saying, we fix it or they're going to. 
and neither one of us will like it when they do it. So we got to fix it. And I said, you think I stabbed you in the back three years ago? I think you've been stabbing me in the back for the last three, two. And, you know, we got to air out some stuff. We have to fix it. And so here I am dealing with that emotionally, and I'm reading this and going, dang, that's me. And the problem is I didn't want to see the goodness of God in his life. And then when I see that he's physically not well, it wasn't, yay, you shouldn't mess with me. It's, oh, God, he's got a wife and a two-year-old. Oh, God. And, and, and I haven't prayed for him. I've prayed against him, but I haven't prayed for him. <laughs> All right. I know everybody doesn't like brutal honesty, but it's where we're at. Thank you for tuning in to today's message from Identity Church. To know more about us, go to identitychurch.net, where you'll find resources such as a calendar, media, and upcoming events. You may also download an app for your mobile device from the Apple App Store or Google Play. Then from your mobile device, you can hear our messages. Read from the Bible, take notes, connect with us on the social media, and even pay your tithe. Again, thank you for tuning in to today's message from Identity Church.